In Search of the Miraculous, Chapter 2 In Petersburg, the summer passed with the usual literary work. I was preparing my books for new editions, reading proofs and so on. This was the terrible summer of 1915, with its gradually lowering atmosphere, from which, in spite of all efforts, I could not free myself. The war was now being waged on Russian territory and was coming nearer to us. Everything was beginning to totter. The hidden suicidal activity which has determined so much in Russian life was becoming more and more apparent. A trial of strength was in progress. Printers were perpetually going on strike. My work was held up and I was already beginning to think that the catastrophe would be upon us before I succeeded in doing what I intended. But my thoughts very often returned to the Moscow talks. Several times when things became particularly difficult, I remember I said to myself, I will give up everything and go to G in Moscow. And at this thought I always felt easier. Time passed. One day, it was already autumn, I was called to the telephone and heard G's voice. He had come to Petersburg for a few days. I went to see him at once and, in between conversations with other people who came to see him on various matters, he spoke to me just as he had in Moscow. When he was leaving next day, he told me he would soon be coming back again. And on this second visit, when I told him about a certain group I went to in Petersburg, where all possible subjects were discussed, from war to psychology. He said that acquaintance with similar groups might be useful, as he was thinking of starting the same kind of work in Petersburg as he was conducting in Moscow. He went to Moscow and promised to return in a fortnight. I spoke of him to some of my friends, and we began to await his arrival. He returned again for a short time. I succeeded, however, in introducing some people to him, in regard to his plans and intentions, he said he wanted to organise his work on a larger scale, give public lectures, arrange a series of experiments and demonstrations, and attract to his work people with a wider and more varied preparation. All this reminded me of a part of what I had heard in Moscow, but I did not clearly understand what experiments and demonstrations he spoke of. This became clear only later. I remember one talk, as usual with G, in a small cafe on the Newski. G told me in some detail about the organisation of groups for his work and about their role in that work. Once or twice he used the word esoteric, which I had not heard from him before, and I was interested in what he meant by it. But when I tried to stop and ask what he meant by the word esoteric, he avoided an answer. This is not important. Well, call it what you like, he said. That is not the point. The point is that a group is the beginning of everything. One man can do nothing, can attain nothing. A group with a real leader can do more. A group of people can do what one man can never do. You do not realise your own situation. You are in prison. All you can wish for, if you are a sensible man, is to escape. But how escape? It is necessary to tunnel under a wall. One man can do nothing. But let us suppose there are ten or twenty men. If they work in turn, and if one covers another, they can complete the tunnel and escape. Furthermore, no one can escape from prison without the help of those who have escaped before. Only they can say in what way escape is possible, or can send tools, files, or whatever may be necessary. But one prisoner alone cannot find these people or get in touch with them. An organisation is necessary. Nothing can be achieved without an organisation. G often returned afterwards to this example of prison and escape from prison in his talks. Sometimes he began with it, and then his favourite statement was that if a man in prison was at any time to have a chance of escape, then he must first of all realise that he is in prison. So long as he fails to realise this, so long as he thinks he is free, he has no chance whatsoever. No one can help or liberate him by force, against his will, in opposition to his wishes. 
if liberation is possible. It is possible only as a result of great labour and great efforts and, above all, of conscious efforts towards a definite aim. Gradually, I introduced a greater and greater number of people to G, and every time he came to Petersburg, I arranged talks and lectures in which he took part, either at some private houses or with some already existing groups. Thirty or forty people used to come. After January 1916, G began to visit Petersburg regularly, every fortnight, sometimes with some of his Moscow pupils. I did not understand everything about the way these meetings were arranged. It seemed to me that G was making much of it unnecessarily difficult. For instance, he seldom allowed me to fix a meeting beforehand. A former meeting usually ended with the announcement that G was returning to Moscow for the following day. On the following morning, he would say that he had decided to stay till the evening. The whole day was passed in cafes where people came who wanted to see G. It was only in the evening, an hour or an hour and a half before we usually began our meetings, that he would say to me, Why not have a meeting tonight? Ring up those who wanted to come and tell them we should be at such and such a place. I used to rush to the telephone, but, of course, at seven or half past seven in the evening, people were already engaged and I could only collect a few people. And some who lived outside Petersburg, in Zarskoy, etc., never succeeded in coming to our meetings. A great deal I afterwards understood differently from the way I did then. And G's chief motive became clearer to me. He by no means wanted to make it easy for people to become acquainted with his ideas. On the contrary, he considered that only by overcoming difficulties, however irrelevant and accidental, could people value his ideas. People do not value what is easily come by, he said, and if a man has already felt something, believe me, he will sit waiting all day at the telephone in case he should be invited, or he will himself ring up and ask and inquire. And whoever expects to be asked, and asked beforehand so that he can arrange his own affairs, let him go on expecting. Of course, for those who are not in Petersburg, this is certainly difficult, but we cannot help it. Later on, perhaps we shall have definite meetings on fixed days. At present, it is impossible to do this. People must show themselves and their valuation of what they have heard. All this, and much else besides, still remained for me, at that time, half open to question. But the lectures, and, in general, all that G said at that time, both at the meeting and outside them, interested me more and more. On one occasion, at one of these meetings, someone asked about the possibility of reincarnation and whether it was possible to believe in cases of communication with the dead. Many things are possible, said G, but it is necessary to understand that man's being, both in life and after death, if it does exist after death, may be very different in quality. The man-machine with whom everything depends upon external influences, with whom everything happens, who is now one, the next moment another, and the next moment a third, has no future of any kind. He is buried, and that is all. Dust returns to dust. This applies to him. In order to be able to speak of any kind of future life, there must be a certain crystallization a certain fusion of man's inner qualities, a certain independence of external influences. If there is anything in a man able to resist external influences, then this very thing itself may also be able to resist the death of the physical body. But think for yourselves what there is to withstand physical death in a man who faints or forgets everything when he cuts his finger. If there is anything in a man, it may survive. If there is nothing, then there is nothing to survive. But even if something survives, its future can be very varied. In certain cases of fuller crystallization, what people call reincarnation may be possible after death, and, in other cases, what people call existence on the other side. 
In both cases, it is the continuation of life in the astral body or with the help of the astral body. You know what the expression astral body means, but the systems with which you are acquainted and which use this expression state that all men have an astral body. This is quite wrong. What may be called the astral body is obtained by means of fusion, that is, by means of terribly hard inner work and struggle. Man is not born with it, and only very few men acquire an astral body. If it is formed, it may continue to live after the death of the physical body, and it may be born again in another physical body. This is reincarnation. If it is not reborn, then, in the course of time, it also dies. It is not immortal, but it can live long after the death of the physical body. Fusion, inner unity, is obtained by means of friction, by the struggle between yes and no in man. If a man lives without inner struggle, if everything happens in him without opposition, if he goes wherever he is drawn or wherever the wind blows, he will remain such as he is. But if a struggle begins in him, and particularly if there is a definite line in this struggle, then, gradually, permanent traits begin to form themselves, he begins to crystallise. But crystallisation is possible on a right foundation, and it is possible on a wrong foundation. Friction, the struggle between yes and no, can easily take place on a wrong foundation. For instance, a fanatical belief in some or other idea, or the fear of sin, can evoke a terribly intense struggle between yes and no, and a man may crystallise on these foundations. But this would be a wrong, incomplete crystallisation. Such a man will not possess the possibility of further development. In order to make further development possible, he must be melted down again, and this can be accomplished only through terrible suffering. Crystallisation is possible on any foundation. Take, for example, a brigade, a really good general brigand. I knew such brigands in the Caucasus. He will stand with a rifle behind a stone by the roadside for eight hours without stirring. Could you do this? All the time, mind you. A struggle is going on in him. He is thirsty and hot, and flies are biting him, but he stands still. Another is a monk. He is afraid of the devil. All night long he beats his head on the floor and prays. Thus crystallisation is achieved. In such ways people can generate in themselves an enormous inner strength. They can endure torture. They can get what they want. This means that there is now in them something solid, something permanent. Such people can become immortal. But what is the good of it? A man of this kind becomes an immortal thing, although a certain amount of consciousness is sometimes preserved in him. But even this, it must be remembered, occurs very rarely. I recollect that the talks which followed that evening struck me by the fact that many people heard something entirely different to what G said. Others only paid attention to G's secondary and non-essential remarks and remembered only these. The fundamental principles in what G said escaped most of them. Only very few asked questions on the essential things he said. One of these questions has remained in my memory. In what way can one evoke the struggle between yes and no in oneself, someone asked. Sacrifice is necessary, said G. If nothing is sacrificed, nothing is obtained, and it is necessary to sacrifice something precious at the moment, to sacrifice for a long time and to sacrifice a great deal, but still not forever. This must be understood because often it is not understood. Sacrifice is necessary only while the process of crystallisation is going on. When crystallisation is achieved, renunciations, privations and sacrifices are no longer necessary. Then a man may have everything he wants. There are no longer any laws for him. He is a law unto himself.
From among those who came to our lectures, a small group of people was gradually formed who did not miss a single opportunity of listening to G and who met together in his absence. This was the beginning of the first Petersburg group. During that time I was a good deal with G and began to understand him better. One was struck by a great inner simplicity and naturalness in him which made one completely forget that he was, for us, the representative of the world of the miraculous and the unknown. Furthermore, one felt very strongly in him the entire absence of any kind of affectation or desire to produce an impression. And together with this, one felt an absence of personal interest in anything he was doing, a complete indifference to ease and comfort, and a capacity for not sparing himself in work, whatever that work might be. Sometimes he liked to be in gay and lively company. He liked to arrange big dinners, buying a quantity of wine and food, of which, however, he often ate or drank practically nothing. Many people get the impression that he was a golderman, a man fond of good living in general, and it seemed to us that he often wanted to create this impression, although all of us already saw that this was acting. Our feeling of this acting in G was exceptionally strong. Among ourselves we often said we never saw him and never would. In any other man so much acting would have produced an impression of falsity. In him acting produced an impression of strength, although, as I have already mentioned, not always, sometimes there was too much of it. I was particularly attracted by his sense of humour and the complete absence of any pretensions to sanctity or to the possession of miraculous powers, although, as we became convinced later, he possessed then the knowledge and ability of creating unusual phenomena of a psychological character. But he always laughed at people who expected miracles from him. He was an extraordinarily versatile man. He knew everything and can do everything. He once told me he had brought back from his travels in the East a number of carpets, among which were many duplicates, and others having no particular value from an artistic point of view. During his visits he had found that the price of carpets in Petersburg was higher than in Moscow, and every time he came he bought a bale of carpets which he sold in Petersburg. According to another version, he simply bought the carpets in Moscow at the Tolkonchukta and brought them to Petersburg to sell. I did not altogether understand why he did this, but I felt it was connected with the idea of acting. The sale of these carpets was in itself remarkable. G put an advertisement in the papers and all kinds of people came to buy carpets. On such occasions they took him, of course, for an ordinary Caucasian carpet seller. I often sat for hours watching him as he talked to the people who came. I saw that he sometimes played on their weak side. One day, he was either in a hurry or had grown tired of acting the carpet seller, and he offered a lady, obviously rich but very grasping, who had selected a dozen fine carpets and was bargaining desperately, all the carpets in the room for about a quarter of the price of those she had chosen. At first she was surprised, but then she began to bargain again. G smiled and said he would think it over and give her his answer the next day. But next day he was no longer in Petersburg, and the woman got nothing at all. Something of this sort happened on nearly every occasion. With these carpets, in the role of travelling merchant, he again gave the impression of a man in disguise, a man of Harun al-Rashid, or the man in the invisible cap of the fairy tale. Once, when I was not there, an occultist of the charlatan type came to him, who played a certain part in some spiritualistic circles in Petersburg, and who later became a professor under the Bolsheviks. He began by saying he had heard a great deal about G and his knowledge, and wanted to make his acquaintance. G, as he told me himself, played the part of a genuine carpet seller, with the strongest Caucasian accent and in broken Russian, he began to assure the occultist that he was mistaken and that he only sold carpets, and he immediately began to unroll and offer him some. The occultist went away fully convinced he had been hoaxed by his friends. 
It was obvious that the rascal had not got a farthing, added G. Otherwise I would have screwed the price of a pair of carpets out of him. A Persian used to come for him to mend carpets. One day I noticed that G was very attentively watching how the Persian was doing his work. I want to understand how he does it, and I don't understand yet, said G. Do you see that hook he has? The whole thing is in that. I wanted to buy it from him, but he won't sell it. Next day I came earlier than usual. G was sitting on the floor mending a carpet exactly as the Persian had done. Walls of various colours were strewn around him, and in his hand was the same kind of hook I had seen with the Persian. It transpired that he had cut it with an ordinary file from the blade of a cheap penknife, and in the course of the morning had fathomed all the mysteries of carpet mending. He told me a great deal about carpets which, as he often said, represented one of the most ancient forms of art. He spoke of the ancient customs connected with carpet making in certain parts of Asia, of a whole village working together at one carpet. Of winter evenings, when all the villagers, young and old, gather together in one large building and, dividing into groups, sit or stand in the floor in an order previously known and determined by tradition. Each group then begins its own work. Some pick stones and splinters out of the wall. Others beat out the wall with sticks. A third group combs the wall. The fourth spins. The fifth dyes the wall. The sixth, or maybe the twenty-sixth, weaves the actual carpet. Men, women and children, old men and old women, all have their own traditional work. And all the work is done to the accompaniment of music and singing. The women spinners with spindles in their hands dance a special dance as they work, and all the movements of all the people engaged in different work are like one movement in one and the same rhythm. Moreover, each locality has its own special tune, its own special songs and dances, connected with carpet making from time immemorial. And as he told me this, the thought flashed across my mind, that perhaps the design and colouring of the carpets are connected with the music, are its expressions in line and colour, that perhaps carpets are records of this music, the notes by which the tunes could be reproduced. There was nothing strange in this idea to me, as I could often see music in the form of a complicated design. From a few incidental talks with G, I obtained some idea of his previous life. His childhood was passed on the frontier of Asia Minor in strange, very remote, almost biblical circumstances of life. Flocks of innumerable sheep, wanderings from place to place, coming into contact with various strange people. His imagination was particularly struck by the Yazidis, the devil worshippers, who, from his earliest youth, had attracted his attention by their incomprehensible customs and strange dependence upon unknown laws. He told me, among other things, that when he was a child he had often observed how Yezedi boys were unable to step out of a circle traced round them on the ground. He had passed his young years in an atmosphere of fairy tales, legends and traditions. The miraculous around him was an actual fact. Predictions of the future which he heard, and which those around him fully believed, were fulfilled and made him believe in many other things. All these things, taken together, had created in him, at a very early age, a leaning towards the mysterious, the incomprehensible and the magical. He told me that when quite young he made several long journeys in the East. What was true in these stories I could never decide exactly. But as he said, in the course of these journeys he again came across many phenomena telling him of the existence of a certain knowledge, of certain powers and possibilities exceeding the ordinary possibilities of man, and of people possessing clairvoyance and other miraculous powers. Gradually, he told me, his absences from home and his travels began to follow one definite aim. He went in search of knowledge and the people who possessed this knowledge. And, as he said, after great difficulties, he found the sources of this knowledge in company with several other people who were, like him, 
also seek in the miraculous. In all these stories about himself, a great deal was contradictory and hardly credible, but I had already realised that no ordinary demands could be made of him, nor could any ordinary standards be applied to him. One could be sure of nothing in regard to him. He might say one thing today and something altogether different tomorrow, and yet, somehow, he could never be accused of contradictions. One had to understand and connect everything together. About schools and where he had found the knowledge he undoubtedly possessed, he spoke very little and always superficially. He mentioned Tibetan monasteries, the Shitrao, Mount Athos, Sufi schools in Persia, in Bokhara and eastern Turkestan. He mentioned dervices of various orders, but all of them in a very indefinite way. During one conversation with G in our group, which was beginning to become permanent, I asked, Why, if ancient knowledge has been preserved, and if, speaking in general, there exists a knowledge distinct from our science and philosophy, or even surpassing it, is it so carefully concealed? Why is it not made common property? Why are the men who possess this knowledge unwilling to let it pass into the general circulation of life for the sake of a better and more successful struggle against deceit evil and ignorance. This is, I think, a question which usually arises in everyone's mind on first acquaintance with the ideas of esotericism. There are two answers to that, said G. In the first place, this knowledge is not concealed, and in the second place, it cannot, from its very nature, become common property. We will consider the second of these statements first. I will prove to you afterwards that knowledge, he emphasised the word, is far more accessible to those capable of assimilating it than is usually supposed, and that the whole trouble is that people either do not want it or cannot receive it. But first of all, another thing must be understood, namely that knowledge cannot belong to all, cannot even belong to many. Such is the law. You do not understand this because you do not understand that knowledge, like everything else in the world, is material. It is material, and this means that it possesses all the characteristics of materiality. One of the first characteristics of materiality is that matter is always limited. That is to say, the quantity of matter in a given place and under given conditions is limited. Even the sand of the desert and the water of the sea is a definite and unchangeable quantity. So that, if knowledge is material, then it means that there is a definite quantity of it in a given place at a given time. It may be said that, in the course of a certain period of time, say a century, humanity has a definite amount of knowledge at its disposal. But we know, even from an ordinary observation of life, that the matter of knowledge possesses entirely different qualities according to whether it is taken in small or large quantities. Taken in a large quantity in a given place, that is, by one man, let us say, or by a small group of men, it produces very good results. Taken in a small quantity, that is, by every one of a large number of people, it gives no results at all, or it may give even negative results, contrary to those expected. Thus, if a certain definite quantity of knowledge is distributed among millions of people, each individual will receive very little, and this small amount of knowledge will change nothing either in his life or in his understanding of things. And however large the number of people who receive this small amount of knowledge, it will change nothing in their lives, except perhaps to make them still more difficult. But if, on the contrary, large quantities of knowledge are concentrated in a small number of people, then this knowledge will give very great results. From this point of view, it is far more advantageous that knowledge should be preserved among a small number of people and not dispersed among the masses. If we take a certain quantity of gold and decide to gild a number of objects with it, we must know or calculate exactly what number of objects can be gilded with this quantity of gold. 
If we try to gild a greater number, they will be covered with gold unevenly, in patches, and will look much worse than if they had no gold at all. In fact, we shall lose our gold. The distribution of knowledge is based upon exactly the same principle. If knowledge is given to all, nobody will get any. If it is preserved among a few, each will receive not only enough to keep, but to increase what he receives. At the first glance, this theory seems very unjust, since the position of those who are, so to speak, denied knowledge in order that others may receive a greater share, appears to be very sad and undeservedly harder than it ought to be. Actually, however, this is not so at all, and in the distribution of knowledge there is not the slightest injustice. The fact is that the enormous majority of people do not want any knowledge whatever. They refuse their share of it and do not even take the ration allotted to them in the general distribution for the purposes of life. This is particularly evident in times of mass madness such as wars, revolutions and so on, when men suddenly seem to lose even the small amount of common sense they had and turn into complete automatons, giving themselves over to wholesale destruction in vast numbers. In other words, even losing the instinct of self-preservation. Owing to this, enormous quantities of knowledge remain, so to speak, unclaimed and can be distributed among those who realise its value. There is nothing unjust in this, because those who receive knowledge take nothing that belongs to others, deprive others of nothing. They take only what others have rejected as useless, and what would in any case be lost if they did not take it. The collecting of knowledge by some depends upon the rejection of knowledge by others. There are periods in the life of humanity which generally coincide with the beginning of the fall of cultures and civilizations, when the masses irretrievably lose their reason and begin to destroy everything that has been created by centuries and millenniums of culture. Such periods of mass madness, often coinciding with geological cataclysms, climatic changes and similar phenomena of a planetary character, release a very great quantity of the matter of knowledge. This, in its turn, necessitates the work of collecting this matter of knowledge which would otherwise be lost. Thus, the work of collecting scattered matter of knowledge frequently coincides with the beginning of the destruction and fall of cultures and civilizations. This aspect of the question is clear. The crowd neither wants nor seeks knowledge, and the leaders of the crowd, in their own interests, try to strengthen its fear and dislike of everything new and unknown. The slavery in which mankind lives is based upon this fear. It is even difficult to imagine all the horror of this slavery. We do not understand what people are losing. But in order to understand the cause of this slavery, it is enough to see how people live, what constitutes the aim of their existence, the object of their desires, passions and aspirations, of what they think, of what they talk, what they serve and what they worship. Consider what the cultured humanity of our time spends money on, even leaving the war out, what commands the highest price, where the biggest crowds are. If we think for a moment about these questions, it becomes clear that humanity, as it is now, with the interests it lives by, cannot expect to have anything different from what it has. But, as I've already said, it cannot be otherwise. Imagine that for the whole of mankind half a pound of knowledge is allotted a year. If this knowledge is distributed among everyone, each will receive so little that he will remain the fool he was. But, thanks to the fact that very few want to have this knowledge, those who take it are able to get, let us say, a grain each and acquire the possibility of becoming more intelligent. All cannot become intelligent even if they wish, and if they did become intelligent, it would not help matters. There exists a general equilibrium which cannot be upset. That is one aspect. The other, as I've already said, consists in the fact that no one is concealing anything. There is no mystery whatever. But the acquisition or transmission of true knowledge demands great labour and great effort both of him who receives and of him who gives. 
and those who possess this knowledge are doing everything they can to transmit and communicate it to the greatest possible number of people, to facilitate people's approach to it and enable them to prepare themselves to receive the truth. But knowledge cannot be given by force to anyone and, as I have already said, an unprejudiced survey of the average man's life, of what fills his day and of the things he is interested in, will at once show whether it is possible to accuse men who possess knowledge of concealing it, of not wishing to give it to people, or of not wishing to teach people what they know themselves. He who wants knowledge must himself make the initial efforts to find the source of knowledge and to approach it, taking advantage of the help and indications which are given to all, but which people, as a rule, do not want to see or recognise. Knowledge cannot come to people without effort on their own part. They understand this very well in connection with ordinary knowledge, but in the case of great knowledge, when they admit the possibility of its existence, they find it possible to expect something different. Everyone knows very well that if, for instance, a man wants to learn Chinese, it will take several years of intense work. Everyone knows that five years are needed to grasp the principles of medicine and perhaps twice as many years for the study of painting or music. And yet there are theories which affirm that knowledge can come to people without any effort on their part, that they can acquire it even in sleep. The very existence of such theories constitutes an additional explanation of why knowledge cannot come to people. At the same time, it is essential to understand that man's independent efforts to attain anything in this direction can also give no results. A man can only attain knowledge with the help of those who possess it. This must be understood from the very beginning. One must learn from him who knows. At one of the following meetings of the Group G continued in reply to a question to develop the ideas given by him before on reincarnation and the future life. The talk began by one of those present asking, Can it be said that man possesses immortality? Immortality is one of the qualities we ascribe to people without having a sufficient understanding of their meaning, said G. Other qualities of this kind are individuality, in the sense of an inner unity, a permanent and unchangeable I, consciousness and will. All these qualities can belong to man. He emphasised the word can. But this certainly does not mean that they do belong to him or belong to each and every one. In order to understand what man is at the present time, that is, at the present level of development, it is necessary to imagine to a certain extent what he can be, that is, what he can attain. Only by understanding the correct sequence of development possible will people cease to ascribe to themselves what, at present, they do not possess and what, perhaps, they can only acquire after great effort and great labour. According to an ancient teaching, traces of which may be found in many systems, old and new, a man who has attained the full development possible for man, a man in the full sense of the word, consists of four bodies. These four bodies are composed of substances which gradually become finer and finer, mutually interpenetrate one another and form four independent organisms standing in a definite relationship to one another but capable of independent action. The reason why it is possible for four bodies to exist is that the human organism, that is, the physical body, has such a complex organisation that, under certain conditions, a new independent organism can grow in it, affording a much more convenient and responsive instrument for the activity of consciousness and the physical body. The consciousness manifested in this new body is capable of governing it and it has full power and full control over the physical body. In this second body, under certain conditions, a third body can grow, again having characteristics of its own. The consciousness manifested in this third body has full power and control over the first two bodies, and the third body possesses the possibility of acquiring knowledge 
inaccessible either to the first or to the second body. In the third body, under certain conditions, a fourth can grow, which differs as much from the third as the third differs from the second and the second from the first. The consciousness manifested in the fourth body has full control over the first three bodies and itself. These four bodies are defined in different teachings in various ways. G drew a diagram, reproduced in figure 1, and said, The first is the physical body, in Christian terminology the carnal body, the second in Christian terminology is the natural body, the third is the spiritual body, and the fourth in the terminology of esoteric Christianity is the divine body. In theosophical terminology, the first is the physical body, the second is the astral, the third is the mental, and the fourth the causal. In the terminology of certain Eastern teachings, the first body is the carriage body, the second body is the horse, feelings, desires, the third the driver, mind, and the fourth the master, I, consciousness, will. Such comparisons and parallels may be found in most systems and teachings which recognise something more in man than the physical body. But almost all these teachings, while repeating in a more or less familiar form the definitions and divisions of the ancient teaching, have forgotten or omitted its most important feature, which is that man is not born with the finer bodies and that they can only be artificially cultivated in him provided favourable conditions both internal and external are present. The astral body is not an indispensable implement for man. It is a great luxury which only a few can afford. A man can live quite well without an astral body. His physical body possesses all the functions necessary for life. A man without astral body may even produce the impression of being a very intellectual or even spiritual man, and may deceive not only others, but it also himself. This implies still more, of course, to the mental body and the fourth body. Ordinary man does not possess these bodies or their corresponding functions, but he often thinks and makes others think that he does. The reasons for this are, first, the fact that the physical body works with the same substances of which the higher bodies are composed, only these substances are not crystallised in him do not belong to him, and secondly, it has all the functions analogous to those of the higher bodies, though, of course, they differ from them considerably. The chief difference between the functions of a man possessing the physical body only and the functions of the four bodies is that, in the first case, the functions of the physical body govern all the other functions. In other words, everything is governed by the body which, in its turn, is governed by external influences. In the second case, the command or control emanates from the higher body. The functions of the physical body may be represented as parallel to the functions of the four bodies. G drew another diagram representing the parallel functions of a man of physical body and a man of four bodies. In the first case, said G, that is, in relation to the functions of a man of physical body only, the automaton depends upon external influences and the next three functions depend upon the physical body and the external influences it receives. Desires or aversions, I want, I don't want, I like, I don't like, that is, functions occupying the place of the second body, depend upon accidental shocks and influences. Thinking, which corresponds to the functions of the third body, is an entirely mechanical process. Will is absent in ordinary mechanical man. He has desires only, and a greater or lesser permanence of desires and wishes is called a strong or a weak will. In the second case, that is, in relation to the functions of the four bodies, the automatism of the physical body depends upon the influences of the other bodies. Instead of the discordant and other contradictory activity of different desires, there is one single I, whole, indivisible and permanent. There is individuality, 
dominating the physical body and its desires and able to overcome both its reluctance and its resistance. Instead of the mechanical process of thinking, there is consciousness. And there is will, that is, a power, not merely composed of various often contradictory desires belonging to different eyes, but issuing from consciousness and governed by individuality or a single and permanent eye. Only such a will can be called free, for it is independent of accident and cannot be altered or directed from without. An Eastern teaching describes the functions of the four bodies, their gradual growth and the conditions of this growth in the following way. Let us imagine a vessel or a retort filled with various metallic powders. The powders are not in any way connected with each other and every accidental change in the position of the retort changes the relative position of the powers. If the retort be shaken or tapped with the finger, then the powder which was at the top may appear at the bottom or in the middle, while the one which was at the bottom may appear at the top. There is nothing permanent in the position of the powders, and under such conditions there can be nothing permanent. This is an exact picture of our psychic life. Each succeeding moment, new influences may change the position of the power which is on the top, and put in its place another which is absolutely its opposite. Science calls this state of the powders the state of mechanical mixture, the essential characteristic of the interrelation of the powders to see one another in this kind of mixture is the instability of these interrelations and their variability. It is impossible to stabilise the interrelation of powders in a state of mechanical mixture, but the powders may be fused, the nature of the powders make this possible. To do this, a special kind of fire must be lighted under the retort, which, by heating and melting the powders, finally fuses them together. Fused in this way, the powders will be in the state of a chemical compound, and now they can no longer be separated by those simple methods which separated and made them change places when they were in a state of mechanical mixture. The contents of the retort have become indivisible, individual. This is a picture of the formation of the second body. The fire by means of which fusion is attained is produced by friction, which in its turn is produced in man by the struggle between yes and no. If a man gives way to all his desires, or panders to them, there will be no inner struggle in him, no friction, no fire. But if, for the sake of attaining a definite aim, he struggles with desires that hinder him, he will then create a fire which will gradually transform his inner world into a single whole. Let us return to our example. The chemical compound obtained by fusion possesses certain qualities, a certain specific gravity, a certain electrical conductivity and so on. These qualities constitute the characteristics of the substance in question. But by means of work upon it of a certain kind, the number of these characteristics may be increased. That is, the alloy may be given new properties which did not primarily belong to it. It may be possible to magnetise it, to make it radioactive, and so on. The process of imparting new properties to the alloy corresponds to the process of the formation of the third body and of the acquisition of new knowledge and powers with the help of the third body. When the third body has been formed and has acquired all the properties, powers and knowledge possible for it, there remains the problem of fixing this knowledge and these powers because, having been imparted to it by influences of a certain kind, they may be taken away by these same influences or by others. By means of a special kind of work for all three bodies, the acquired properties may be made the permanent and inalienable possession of the third body. The process of fixing these acquired properties corresponds to the process of the formation of the fourth body. And only the man who possesses four fully developed bodies can be called a man in the full sense of the word. This man possesses many properties which ordinary man does not possess. One of these properties is immortality. All religions and all ancient teachings contain the idea that, 
by acquiring the fourth body, man acquires immortality, and they all contain indications of the ways to acquire the fourth body, that is, immortality. In this connection, certain teachings compare man to a house of four rooms. Man lives in one room, the smallest and poorest of all, and until he is told of it, he does not suspect the existence of the other rooms which are full of treasures. When he does learn of this, he begins to seek the keys of these rooms, and especially of the fourth, the most important room. And when a man has found his way into this room, he really becomes the master of his house, but only then does the house belong to him wholly and forever. The fourth room gives man immortality, and all religious teachings strive to show the way to it. There are a great many ways, some shorter and some longer, some harder and some easier, but all, without exception, lead or strive to lead in one direction, that is, to immortality. At the next meeting, G began where he had left off the time before. I said last time, he said, that immortality is not a property with which man is born, but man can acquire immortality. All existing and genuinely known ways to immortality can be divided into three categories. 1. The way of the fakir. 2. The way of the monk. 3. The way of the yogi. The way of the fakir is the way of struggle with the physical body, the way of work on the first room. This is a long, difficult and uncertain way. The fakir strives to develop physical will, power over the body. This is attained by means of terrible sufferings, by torturing the body. The whole way of the fakir consists of various incredibly difficult physical exercises. The fakir either stands motionless in the same position for hours, days, months or years, or sits with outstretched arms on a bare stone in sun, rain and snow, or tortures himself with fire, puts his leg into an ant heap and so on. If he does not fall ill and die before what may be called physical will is developed in him, then he attains the fourth room or the possibility of forming the fourth body. But his other functions, emotional, intellectual and so forth, remain undeveloped. He has acquired will, but he has nothing to which he can apply it. He cannot make use of it for gaining knowledge or for self-perfection. As a rule, he is too old to begin new work. But where there are schools of fakirs, there are also schools of yogis. Yogis generally keep an eye on fakirs. If a fakir attains what he has aspired to before he is too old, they take him into a yogi school, where first they heal him and restore his power of movement, and then begin to teach him. A fakir has to learn to walk and to speak like a baby, but he now possesses a will which has overcome incredible difficulties on his way, and this will may help him to overcome the difficulties on the second part of the way, the difficulties, namely, of developing the intellectual and emotional functions. You cannot imagine what hardships fakirs undergo. I do not know whether you have seen real fakirs or not, I have seen many. For instance, I saw one in the inner court of a temple in India, and I even slept near him. Day and night for twenty years he had been standing on the tips of his fingers and toes. He was no longer able to straighten himself. His pupils carried him from one place to another, took him to the river and washed him like some inanimate object. But this was not attained all at once. Think what he had to overcome what tortures he must have suffered in order to get to that stage. And a man becomes a fakir not because he understands the possibilities and the results of this way, and not because of religious feeling. In all eastern countries where fakirs exist, there is a custom among the common people of promising to give to fakirs a child born after some happy event. Besides this, fakirs often adopt orphans or simply buy little children from poor parents. These children become their pupils and imitate them or are made to imitate them, some only outwardly, but some afterwards become fakirs themselves. In addition to these, other people become fakirs simply from being struck by some fakir they have seen. 
Near every fakir in the temples, people can be seen who imitate them, who sit or stand in the same posture. Not for long, of course, but still occasionally for several hours. And sometimes it happens that a man who went into the temple accidentally on a feast day and began to imitate some fakir who particularly struck him does not return home any more, but joins the crowd of that fakir's disciples and later, in the course of time, becomes a fakir himself. You must understand that I take the word fakir in quotation marks. In Persia, fakir simply means a beggar, and in India, a great many jugglers call themselves fakirs. And the Europeans, particularly learned Europeans, very often give the name of fakir to yogis, as well as to monks of various wandering orders. But in reality, the way of the fakir, the way of the monk and the way of the yogi are entirely different. So far I have spoken of fakirs. This is the first way. The second way is the way of the monk. This is the way of faith, the way of religious feeling, religious sacrifice. Only a man with very strong religious emotions and a very strong religious imagination can become a monk in the true sense of the word. The way of the monk also is very long and hard. A monk spends years and tens of years struggling with himself, but all his work is concentrated on the second room, on the second body, that is, on feelings. Subjecting all his other emotions to one emotion, that is, to faith, he develops unity in himself will over the emotions and in this way reaches the fourth room. But his physical body and his thinking capacities may remain undeveloped. In order to be able to make use of what he has attained, he must develop his body and his capacity to think. This can only be achieved by means of fresh sacrifices, fresh hardships, fresh renunciations. A monk has to become a yogi and a fakir. Very few get as far as this, even fewer overcome all difficulties. Most of them either die before this or become monks in outward appearance only. The third way is the way of the yogi. This is the way of knowledge, the way of mind. The way of the yogi consists in working on the third room and in striving to enter the fourth room by means of knowledge. The yogi reaches the fourth room by developing his mind but his body and emotions remain undeveloped and, like the fakir and the monk, he is unable to make use of the results of his attainment. He knows everything but can do nothing. In order to begin to do, he must gain the mastery over his body and emotions, that is, over the first and second rooms. To do this, he must again set to work and again obtain results by means of prolonged efforts. In this case, however, he has the advantage of understanding his position, of knowing what he lacks, what he must do, and in what direction he must go. But, as on the way of the fakir or the monk, very few acquire this understanding on the way of the yogi, that is, that level in his work on which a man knows where he is going. A great many stop at one particular achievement and go no further. The way also differ from each other by their relation to the teacher or leader. On the way of the fakir, a man has no teacher in the true sense of the word. The teacher in this case does not teach, but simply serves as an example. The pupil's work consists in imitating the teacher. On the way of the monk, a man has a teacher, and a part of his duty, a part of his work, consists in having absolute faith in the teacher in submitting to him absolutely, in obedience. But the chief thing on the way of the monk is faith in God, in the love of God, in constant efforts to obey and serve God, although in his understanding of the idea of God and of serving God, there may be much that is subjective and contradictory. On the way of the yogi, a man can do nothing and must do nothing without a teacher. In the beginning, he must imitate his teacher like the fakir and believe in him like the monk. But afterwards, a man on the way of the yogi gradually becomes his own teacher. He learns his teacher's methods and gradually learns to apply them to himself. But all the ways, the way of the fakir as well as the way of the monk and the way of the yogi, have one thing in common. 
They all begin with the most difficult thing, with a complete change of life, with a renunciation of all worldly things. A man must give up his house, his family if he has one, renounce all the pleasures, attachments and duties of life and go out into the desert or into a monastery or a yogi school. From the very first day, from the very first step on his way, he must die to the world. Only thus can he hope to attain anything on one of these ways. In order to grasp the essence of this teaching, it is necessary clearly to understand the idea that the ways are the only possible methods for the development of man's hidden possibilities. This in turn shows how difficult and rare such development is. The development of these possibilities is not a law. The law for man is existence in the circle of mechanical influences, the state of man-machine. The way of the development of hidden possibilities is a way against nature, against God. This explains the difficulties and the exclusiveness of the ways. The ways are narrow and straight, but at the same time only by them can anything be obtained. In the general mass of everyday life, especially modern life, the ways are a small, quite imperceptible phenomenon which, from the point of view of life, need not exist at all. But this small phenomenon contains in itself all that man has for the development of his hidden possibilities. The ways are opposed to everyday life, based upon other principles and subject to other laws. In this consists their power and their significance. In everyday life, even in a life filled with scientific, philosophical, religious or social interests, there is nothing, and there can be nothing, which could give the possibilities which are contained in the ways. The ways lead, or should lead, man to immortality. Everyday life, even at its best, leads man to death and can lead to nothing else. The idea of the ways cannot be understood if the possibility of man's evolution without their help, is admitted. As a rule, it is hard for man to reconcile himself to this thought. It seems to him exaggerated, unjust and absurd. He has a poor understanding of the meaning of the word possibility. He fancies that if he has any possibilities in himself, they must be developed and that there must be means for their development in his environment. From a total refusal to acknowledge in himself any possibilities whatever, man generally proceeds forthwith to demand the imperative and inevitable development of these possibilities. It is difficult for him to accept the thought that his possibilities may remain altogether undeveloped and disappear, and that their development, on the other hand, requires of him tremendous effort and endurance. As a matter of fact, if we take all the people who are neither fakirs, monks nor yogis, and of whom we may say with confidence that they never will be either fakirs, monks or yogis, then we may say with undoubted certainty that their possibilities cannot be developed and will not be developed. This must be clearly understood in order to grasp all that follows. In the ordinary conditions of cultured life, the position of a man even of an intelligent man who is seeking for knowledge is hopeless because in the circumstances surrounding him there is nothing resembling either fakir or yogi schools while the religions of the West have degenerated to such an extent that for a long time there has been nothing alive in them. Various occult and mystical societies and naive experiments in the nature of spiritualism and so on can give no results whatever. And the position would indeed be hopeless if the possibility of yet a fourth way did not exist. The fourth way requires no retirement into the desert, does not require a man to give up and renounce everything by which he formerly lived. The fourth way begins much further on than the way of the yogi. This means that a man must be prepared for the fourth way and this preparation must be acquired in ordinary life and be a very serious one embracing many different sides. Furthermore, a man must be living in conditions favourable for work on the fourth way or, in any case, in conditions which do not render it impossible. 
It must be understood that both in the inner and in the external life of a man there may be conditions which create insuperable barriers to the fourth way. Furthermore, the fourth way has no definite forms like the way of the fakir, the monk and the yogi. And, first of all, it has to be found. This is the first test. It is not as well known as the three traditional ways. There are many people who have never heard of the fourth way and there are others who deny its existence or possibility. At the same time, the beginning of the fourth way is easier than the beginnings of the ways of the fakir, the monk and the yogi. On the fourth way, it is possible to work and to follow this way while remaining in the usual conditions of life, continuing to do the usual work, preserving former relations with people and without renouncing or giving up anything. On the contrary, the conditions of life in which a man is placed at the beginning of his work, in which, so to speak, the work finds him, are the best possible for him, at any rate at the beginning of the work. These conditions are natural for him. These conditions are the man himself, because a man's life and its conditions correspond to what he is. Any conditions different from those created by life would be artificial for a man, and in such artificial conditions the work would not be able to touch every side of his being at once. Thanks to this, the fourth way affects simultaneously every side of man's being. It is work on the three rooms at once. The fakir works on the first room, the monk on the second, the yogi on the third. In reaching the fourth room, the fakir, the monk and the yogi leave behind them many things unfinished and they cannot make use of what they have attained because they are not masters of all their functions. The fakir is master of his body, but not of his emotions or his mind. The monk is master of his emotions, but not of his body or his mind. The yogi is master of his mind, but not of his body or his emotions. Then the fourth way differs from the other ways, in that the principal demand made upon a man is the demand for understanding. A man must do nothing that he does not understand, except as an experiment under the supervision and direction of his teacher. The more a man understands what he is doing, the greater will be the results of his efforts. This is a fundamental principle of the fourth way. The results of work are in proportion to the consciousness of the work. No faith is required on the fourth way. On the contrary, faith of any kind is opposed to the fourth way. On the fourth way, a man must satisfy himself of the truth of what he is told, and until he is satisfied, he must do nothing. The method of the fourth way consists in doing something in one room and simultaneously doing something corresponding to it in the two upper rooms. That is to say, while working on the physical body to work simultaneously on the mind and the emotions while working on the mind, to work on the physical body and the emotions, while working on the emotions, to work on the mind and the physical body. This can be achieved thanks to the fact that on the fourth way it is possible to make use of certain knowledge inaccessible to the ways of the fakir, the monk and the yogi. This knowledge makes it possible to work in three directions simultaneously. A whole parallel series of physical, mental and emotional exercises serve this purpose. In addition, on the fourth way it is possible to individualise the work of each separate person. That is to say, each person can do only what is necessary and not what is useless for him. This is due to the fact that the fourth way dispenses with a great deal of what is superfluous and preserved simply through tradition in the other ways. So that when a man attains will on the fourth way, he can make use of it because he has acquired control of all his bodily, emotional and intellectual functions. And besides, he has saved a great deal of time by working on the three sides of his being in parallel and simultaneously. The fourth way is sometimes called the way of the sly man, the sly man knows some secret which the fakir, monk and yogi do not know. How the sly man learned this secret, it is not known. Perhaps he found it in some old books, 
Perhaps he inherited it. Perhaps he bought it. Perhaps he stole it from someone. It makes no difference. The sly man knows the secret and with its help outstrips the fakir, the monk and the yogi. Of the four, the fakir acts in the crudest manner. He knows very little and understands very little. Let us suppose that by a whole month in intense torture he develops in himself a certain energy, a certain substance which produces certain changes in him. He does it absolutely blindly with his eyes shut, knowing neither aim, methods nor results, simply in imitation of others. The monk knows what he wants a little better. He is guided by religious feeling, by religious tradition, by a desire for achievement, for salvation. He trusts his teacher who tells him what to do and he believes that his efforts and sacrifices are pleasing to God. Let us suppose that a week of fasting, continual prayer, privations and so on enables him to attain what the fakir develops in himself by a month of self-torture. The yogi knows considerably more. He knows what he wants. He knows why he wants it. He knows how it can be acquired. He knows, for instance, that it is necessary for his purpose to produce a certain substance in himself. He knows that this substance can be produced in one day by a certain kind of mental exercises or concentration of consciousness. So he keeps his attention on these exercises for a whole day without allowing himself a single outside thought and he obtains what he needs. In this way a yogi spends on the same thing only one day compared with a month spent by the fakir and a week spent by the monk. But on the fourth way knowledge is still more exact and perfect. A man who follows the fourth way knows quite definitely what substances he needs for his aims and he knows that these substances can be produced within the body by a month of physical suffering, by a week of emotional strain or by a day of mental exercises and also that they can be introduced into the organism from without if it is known how to do it. And so, instead of spending a whole day in exercises like the yogi, a week in prayer like the monk, or a month in self-torture like the fakir, he simply prepares and swallows a little pill which contains all the substances he wants. And in this way, without loss of time, he obtains the required results. It must be further noted, said G, that in addition to these proper and legitimate ways, there are also artificial ways which give temporary results only, and wrong ways which may even give permanent results, only wrong results. On these ways a man also seeks the key to the fourth room, and sometimes finds it. But what he finds in the fourth room is not yet known. It also happens that the door to the fourth room is opened artificially with a skeleton key and in both these cases the room may prove to be empty. With this, G stopped. At one of the following talks we again touched on the ways. For a man of Western culture, I said, it is of course quite difficult to believe and to accept the idea that an ignorant fakir, a naive monk or a yogi who has retired from life may be on the way to evolution, while an educated European, armed with exact knowledge and all the latest methods of investigation, has no chance whatever and is moving in a circle from which there is no escape. Yes, that is because people believe in progress and culture, said G. There is no progress whatever. Everything is just the same as it was thousands and tens of thousands of years ago. The outward form changes, the essence does not change. Man remains just the same. Civilised and cultured people live with exactly the same interests as the most ignorant savages. Modern civilization is based on violence and slavery and fine words. But all these fine words about progress and civilization are merely words. This, of course, produced a particularly deep impression on us because it was said in 1916 when the latest manifestation of civilization, in the form of a war such as the world had not yet seen was continuing to grow and develop drawing more and more millions of people into its orbit. I remember that a few days before this talk I had seen two enormous lorries on the litany loaded to the height of the first floor of the houses with new 
unpainted wooden crutches. For some reason, I was particularly struck by these lorries. In these mountains of crutches, for legs which were not yet torn off, there was a particularly cynical mockery of all the things with which people deceive themselves. Involuntarily, I imagined that similar lorries were sure to be going about in Berlin, Paris, London, Vienna, Rome and Constantinople. And, as a result, all these cities, almost all of which I knew so well and liked just because they were so different, and because they supplemented and gave contrast to one another, had now become hostile both to me and to each other, and separated by new walls of hatred and crime. I spoke to our people about these lorry loads of crutches, and of my thoughts about them at a meeting. What do you expect, said G. People are machines. Machines have to be blind and unconscious. They cannot be otherwise, and all their actions have to correspond to their nature. Everything happens. No one does anything. Progress and civilization, in the real meaning of these words, can appear only as the result of conscious efforts. They cannot appear as the result of unconscious mechanical actions. And what conscious effort can there be in machines? And if one machine is unconscious, then a hundred machines are unconscious, and so are a thousand machines, or a hundred thousand, or a million and the unconscious activity of a million machines must necessarily result in destruction and extermination. It is precisely in unconscious involuntary manifestations that all evil lies. You do not yet understand and cannot imagine all the results of this evil, but the time will come when you will understand. With this, so far as I remember, the talk ended. <laughs>